Thank you for listening to this PYA webinar recast. PYA is pleased to offer this alternative way to access our thought leadership. This is a recording of a previously delivered webinar. The information is accurate as of the date of the original event. The video recording, slides, and associated material for this and all PYA webinars are available on our website at pyapc.com. This podcast is for educational purposes only. It is not intended to be used as legal advice or an official opinion. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the latest episode of PYA's Healthcare Regulatory Roundup webinar series. Today's topic is the healthcare privacy forecast navigating the regulatory climate. PYA is happy to present today's webinar on this important topic. With that, here are today's presenters, Karen Anderson and Aaron Walker. Thank you, Dan, and good morning, everyone. I'm happy to be here talking with you on these topics today. My name is Erin Walker. I am a consulting manager at PYA. Um, I spend a lot of my time, in fact, a majority of it, um, in the HIPAA uh, security and privacy world, um, advising our clients as it relates to their privacy and security programs and helping them just to continue to ensure that they have strong programs in place. Uh, really looking forward to our discussion today, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Karen, who will introduce herself and kick us off. All right. Thanks, Aaron. Hey, I am fortunate to work with Aaron. I'm at uh, PYA and um, I'm a healthcare consultant and get to work in all things sort of healthcare compliance, but particularly love privacy. And that is what today is full of. So let's get started. Okay. So pot off the press is reproductive health privacy. So less than 60 days ago, we have a new amended HIPAA privacy rule. Um, and basically, just a level set, it's a new subset of protected health information um, that has very limited disclosures. Um, and we're gonna run through all that today and really what it means to us practically too. Like, what do we need to do um, to operationalize this rule? Okay, so this all begins two years ago, July, 2022. Um, there is an order from the president to the Health and Human Services, and it says, Health and Human Services, get back to me in 30 days, and I want you to do two things. Strengthen the protection of sensitive information um, related to reproductive health care, and also bolster patient provider confidentiality. And so what does that mean and why did this happen? So we may remember there was a U.S. Supreme Court case um, that overturned Roe v. Wade. And so it changed what we had as a law at that time was a constitutional right to abortion at a certain gestational age. So we had one rule. And then suddenly there were state laws in place that actually were trigger laws that went immediately into effect. And so what we saw is that suddenly we had sort of a patchwork of 50 or could have 50 different laws. And one of the concerns at that time was that some of these laws were criminal, so they could lead to criminal investigations, um, criminal prosecutions, and both patients and providers were concerned about that when they were sort of um, when they were attempting to have care that was sort of lawful in a particular state. We'll get into that in a minute, but I just want to level set that was sort of the picture at the time, and that's that's why um, the president issued this executive order. Okay, so first, really before we go further, I wanted to define reproductive health as in this amended um, HIPAA privacy rule. Um, it's broad. It affects the health of an individual in all matters relating to the reproductive health system. So in the rule, they actually give all kinds of really a long body of examples, but think about the whole lifetime of your reproductive health system, right? From issues that someone might have as a teenager diagnosis to contraception, to pregnancy, to menopause, and all the medications, treatments, and things um, in between. And they specifically say it relates to provision of medications and devices, even those that you would purchase over the counter. So it also says that whatever the definition is, when you're looking at interpreting is something reproductive healthcare, interpret it broadly, not narrowly. So sort of the benefit of the doubt is it's more than likely reproductive health care information if you're if you're questioning it. The other issue that we're going to talk about it in 
um, a little bit later, but we wanted to go ahead and say here, they're talking about reproductive health that care that has been delivered lawfully in that particular state. So if, if a particular state, a person has gone to seek um, health care, reproductive health care, it was permitted to be um, delivered in that state, that sort of service, then it's considered lawful. And so that is that is the care that they're talking about today. This will make a little bit more sense, hopefully, uh, as we progress through the presentation. Okay, so just generally, this is HHS heeded the call, Office of Civil Rights amends the HIPAA privacy rule. It's effective June 25th, 2024, which I believe is next Tuesday. So, you know, here we are, right on the cusp. And, um, and basically, HHS says we did the things the president asked us to do, right? We strengthened the privacy protections for medical records and health information um, for both um, patients as well as providers or those facilitating um, reproductive health care. We also have really supported that patient information is going to be confidential. And one of the things that they talk about in the Office of Civil Rights is they view reproductive health care information like psychotherapy notes. So think of that subset of information as being thing that about highly personal issues, thought to be very sensitive information. And so it's really got an extra layer of protection on it. And HHS said, you know, we heard from, I think they got over 50,000 comments and input from communities that changes really were needed um, to protect that information, know that information was private. Aaron, you made a good analogy too about think of this information like substance use disorder records, right? It's a special subset of information. It has an extra layer of protection um, and a different process because of it when it comes to disclosure. Um, okay, so just generally, we thought we'd give you a little overview before we go slide by slide into the details. So this is, we said, it's a particular subset of information all related to reproductive health care. Um, it's a new, what they call a purpose-based disclosure prohibition. But in short, that means if you're requesting information and the purpose that you want the information for is a prohibited purpose, purpose it's not permitted, right? You can't get it without the patient's authorization. So two specific purposes that they were trying to avoid disclosure, right? They don't want it disclosed for. If, if the purpose is that you want information to investigate or impose liability on any person for the act of seeking or obtaining, so that'd be the patients, I'm trying to seek or obtain reproductive health care, or I'm providing, the providers, providing or facilitating reproductive health care might be somebody helping you find, you know, where I can get that particular care. Um, basically, those are prohibited purposes. So if you want the information for that, you can't get it. Uh, the other thing is you can't request um, medical the medical record information around reproductive health care if it's to identify a person for that purpose. And so that made me think of like I'm requesting a patient record. I know they went and got reproductive health care services. And I want to know all the providers that were involved. So you can't you can't do it for that purpose as well. Those would be, both be prohibited. So that's generally what we're talking about today. And then also for people that are making those medical record requests, there's a new attestation requirement. So um, if Aaron's requesting the record, I'm the covered entity, right? I'm going to ask Aaron to um, complete an attestation form. We'll talk about that in more detail, but Aaron is the requester would have to say, okay, this information is sought for HIPAA compliant purposes. She'd have to give a good bit of information about that um, um, and then submit that to the covered entity or business associate. The other thing that we need to keep in mind is the notice of privacy practices will be changing to incorporate this new type of information or this new definition of reproductive health information, as well as, you know, how, um, how the entity will use it and how they will disclose it. So, um, and then in general, we can tell a lot of this goes around medical record requests. So, it operationalizing this will definitely be a challenge to forms, process, policies, that kind of thing. 
So we wanted to talk about that a little bit. Okay, so we'll just dig into this a little bit more. I know we said this a minute ago, but um, the final rule prohibits the disclosure of information to conduct investigations, we said. And then they define that further. It's to conduct criminal, civil, or administrative investigations or impose that type of liability on any person. Again, a person that seeks or obtains reproductive health care or a person that provides it or a person that facilitates um, those services. <clears throat> Again, where such health care is lawful under the circumstances. So what does that mean? One example uh, Aaron and I were chatting about was perhaps you wanted to make a complaint about a physician, you know, related to this that provided a reproductive health care service and you would report them, say, to the state medical board, well, that's administrative liability. So a physician licensure hearing or investigation is administrative liability. Um, so, so that just is an example of what they mean there. Criminal, of course, we, we know what that is. Some of these laws are criminal, which means um, it could be punishable by jail time. And then civil is usually sort of a, a financial um, fine um, or other other actions sort of in a lawsuit, if you will. And then again, the second, the second piece of that is it's a prohibited disclosure for the identification of any purpose for the purpose of conducting the investigation or um, seeking such liability against that person. Anything else on that, Aaron? No, I don't think so. I just think it's important to point out that, you know, a lot of this um, with regard to the use and disclosure was um, providers just had concerns um, because there are, you know, it's the, the key word is obtained lawfully. Um, and that doesn't mean that only in the state where you live. Um, so if if a patient travels to another state and where where the reproductive health care service is lawful um, and the provider provides it, the providers had concerns. Just what can I be held liable for? And so um, this is, you know, again, as Karen pointed out, it's it's to protect this health information, but um, also protect um, the providers and the covered entities. That's perfect. I knew she'd say it better than I would. So, um, okay, so then the final rule, another piece of this is what they call sort of the rule of applicability, applicability. But basically what it is, is the covered entity, when you get a request for information, you've got to, you've got to or when you're trying to decide um, about this issue, you have to determine if the rule applies and it applies to these situations and you would make a determination about that. So if any one of these exists, then you're dealing with sort of the, restrictions of reproductive health. One is, is the reproductive health care is lawful under the law of the state in which it was provided. So if that's the case, if you're dealing with care that was allowed to be provided in that state by state law, then that's fine. Or if the reproductive health care is protected by either federal law, the U.S. Constitution, or authorized by that, regardless of what state you're in, if it's that situation, and they gave an example in OCR that that could be um, like con the right to um, contraception is a constitutional right. So that would be one, it didn't matter what state you're in, that this rule would apply. And then finally, this was an example we wrestled with a little bit, but basically it says, if you receive this request for information, reproductive health information, and you were not the provider of the care, then there's a presumption that goes along with it that says you you can just presume that the care that was delivered was lawful and then again the rule would apply and so the example that they gave of that which makes sense to me is you're a, let's say you're a health plan and you receive a request for information about the beneficiary um, who received the repro reproductive health care um, so you didn't provide the care but you have records related to the care um, so <clears throat> As a health plan, you get to presume that the reproductive health care is lawful, meaning again, this rule and all the limitations of it will apply to that request for information. And I'll go ahead and jump to, so it so that last situation goes along with the presumption. And I know this feels a little bit in the weeds, but it's probably important to know because it tells you a little bit about what your process has to be. So if you're in that situation where you didn't deliver the care, but you're getting the medical record request um, for reproductive health information, 
you you can presume it's lawful, but there are a couple of exceptions in which you'd have to make a determination. If you have actual knowledge that the reproductive health care was not lawful under the circumstances it would, in which it was provided, or if you receive factual information from the person making the request that the PHI demonstrates that it demonstrates there's a substantial factual basis that the care was not lawful. I know that sounds confusing, but those two situations, if presented themselves, you'd had to make a determination um, of perhaps the presumption has been overcome and it goes away and you can no longer presume that the care is lawful. What I would say to you, sort of the message here is, this rule generally favors not disclosing information. Uh, reproductive health care information. So in the situation where a medical requester is giving you additional information showing that it uh, was not lawful care in the state in which it was rendered, um, this is the time you sort of trigger that, um, who do I need to get involved at my facility? Do I need legal counsel? But always favor not disclosing until you get it figured out. Um, I think that's the key there. And then finally, um, this again affects sort of our medical record request process, like this attestation process. So upon uh, when you receive a request for PHI, and the request is if it is potentially related to reproductive health care, then um, and if you receive it from any of these particular healthcare oversight agency, judicial administrative proceedings, law enforcement purposes disclosures, coroners, and medical examiners, if you receive it from any of those agencies, you're going to require an attestation um, stating that the user disclosure, what they want the information for, is not a prohibited purpose under HIPAA. So not to fear, you don't have to create that form yet. The um, compliance deadline for this rule is December 22nd, 2024. And um, OCR has promised they will have model attestation language before then. So we're going to all be sort of watching and, and we'll get that out to you of the what the model attestation language is going to look like. And I think most people will probably readily adopt that information. So just remember, these are sort of, and I, I guess I don't want to call them the suspect agencies, but these are the agencies they've decided might be looking for information to either investigate a patient or provider or impose liability or try to identify folks related to this. So um, there, there's an additional step on those people if they're requesting medical information. And then, as we said before, you can imagine that this is going to implicate your notice of privacy practices, right? The um, You're going to have to address reproductive health care um, information as a new sort of area of information on your notice of privacy practices and always you've got to describe how you use or disclose that information so you'd want to kind of mirror the rule. The other thing um, that they added in here into this amended, they were amending right, the HIPAA privacy rule is um, you know we know we've had updates to part two um, regs for um, HIPAA for substance use disorder and so they also have specifics in there about how to change um, the notice of privacy practices to comply with part two. So just look at both of those sets of regs when you're going to address and update your notice of privacy practices. Um, what, oh, one thing I was gonna uh, remind you is there's an HHS fact sheet um, and it is, it's helpful. It goes over just these basic areas that we're talking about, but it, it has a couple examples on things and that might be helpful to you as well. Um, and their website is is good on this as always. HHS has a good website and you just go to reproductive health and you'll find it. Um, and then the final thing we wanted to emphasize here really is the disclosures to law enforcement. So um, basically if law enforcement requests information, you know sometimes under HIPAA we can we are permitted to provide information and so we can make the decision to provide information in this particular instance if law enforcement is requesting the information you've got to meet all these three categories so one the disclosure is not subject to the prohibition so that's what the attestation would tell you 
but the disclosure has to be required by law. So you have to be required to provide this information to law enforcement. And, um, and then the disclosure has to meet all the applicable conditions of the privacy rule. So Aaron, I think you said it best before, there's, it doesn't seem like there's going to be a way that you're gonna provide this to law enforcement in most situations, I think, right? Yeah, I do think that I think the hurdle will be um, the last two bullets will probably be easily met in many instances, but it's going to be um, that prohibition um, that's that's probably going to throw a wrench in things and or not necessarily a wrench in things, but but you're not going to be able to overcome that. I don't yeah. think too often. No, I agree. Um, so and we'll see how this all works out. But we wanted to give you again just a little summary of the changes. Just remember the prohibited, we're still getting used to the language ourselves, but the prohibited disclosures or uses is when is kind of purpose-based. So if my purpose is I want to get it to investigate or impose liability on individuals, think patients and providers, um, when the when the reproductive health care was lawful in that state in which it was delivered or provided um then that's that's going to be a disclosure that is prohibited right and then um the attestation at the medical record level for those four agencies um you're going to have to just revamp a little bit the medical record process and then notice the privacy practices will change. And when I say revamp a little bit, I don't I don't mean to be silly. I know this is a really big deal, right? It's a new kind of information, the medical record request to operationalize this, we get this, what this takes to, um, Aaron and I talked about, again, you're having to try to take a whole record and figure out how to segment off that information. You know, what is reproductive health care and how do we create sort of a subset of information so that we can protect that information? That might, that's kind of step one and probably one of the hardest parts, as well as addressing, um, you know, forms, the procedure at the medical record request, and updating the notice of privacy practices. And so, and as always practical, right, then you got to train everybody. Um, and, and particularly probably some focus training on those that are handling those medical record requests day in and day out. Then, as always, not to be on a negative note, but they're, they are telling us that they will investigate these complaints about, about this if um, reproductive health care was disclosed inappropriately or requested inappropriately. So for HIPAA regulated entities, covered entities, business associates, there is criminal liability if you um, knowingly disclose the information. Um, so um, it's also criminal liability on the requester if they falsified an attestation, they knowingly obtained the information. There's also civil liability for the covered entity business associate if they disclosed it without obtaining a valid attestation. Of course, that's where we see where there could be hiccups. The, when we all dig into the attestation a little bit more, there's specific things that have to be completed by the requester, and it's going to be the job of the covered entity or business associate to make sure that is a fully completed attestation that you accept before you do the disclosure. So, and otherwise you could have civil penalties. So that's just something to remember. And then finally, we wish this had happened before our seminar, but tomorrow the Office of Civil Rights is having a, a briefing and they said they're going to get an overview of the rule and they're going to do q and I think probably prepared Q&A, but it is the Office of Civil Rights Leadership that's going to lead it. It's at two o'clock Eastern time. I put the link in there for you. We're going to attend and, um, and you know, hopefully, hopefully it'll, there'll be some clarity. We'll see. Um, so anyway, I think Dan, we're on to, we're on to polling question number one. Our first polling question today is, our organization is prepared to comply with the final rule requirements regarding reproductive health privacy. Yes, partially, no, unsure, or the final rule is not applicable to our organization. Remember, you must answer the polling questions to receive CPE credit. Thank you for participating. Now back to our presenters. Okay, those are good results, right? Those are really good results, yeah. Okay, I'm very impressed with the yeses. It's hard. Me too. It hard to, yeah, it was hard, hard to get through that, some of that information. So, 
Okay, I think we are, here we go. Okay, so a little bit easier topic. We know about informed consent, right? Patient informed consent, we have done that forever as healthcare providers. So um, there's a little tweak on it now. So April 1st from CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, issued interpretive guidance on the existing hospital conditions of participation related to informed consent. And um, the focus is on medical training. Um, and I'll tell you what happened. So um, basically there were reports at facilities that had like residents or medical students, anyone that is sort of training that patients that were under anesthesia were given without their consent um, sensitive exams, what they've defined as sensitive exams, breast, pelvic, prostate, rectal exams. And uh, the institutions we understand explained that, you know, that's for educational and training purposes. I think, I don't know, I assume they thought that maybe the patient would be comfortable under anesthesia. Um, but regardless, they were um, said, you know, this is sort of back to informed consent. The patient has to be given um, the opportunity to consent to this, particularly if it's only for educational and training purposes, and particularly because it's a sensitive um, exam. So, um, so they said, okay, when we come out and survey for the hospital conditions of participation, we're going to be particularly looking um, at this issue. So they're asking us to address you whether um, hospital covered entity. Um, Ha, must inform patient if the examination invasive procedure or important task in surgery performed was for educational and training purposes. If so, it's going to require consent. Um, and we'll get into this just a little bit more, but it is going to affect looking at looking at as a, a hospital um, the policy procedure and the forms. So we just kind of wanted to make you aware of this. And this is just a reminder, there's a hospital conditions of participation about the patient has a right to make informed decisions about their health care. Um, they have a right to be involved. And you remember it's the normal, like provide information about their health care diagnosis and their current condition, provide information about the risks of the proposed treatment or procedure. Um, Ben, the benefits to it, the alternatives to it. And in essence, the AMA sort of says, you know, have you given them the right information where that person can make a well-informed decision? So they're just calling you back to reminding, okay, there's always been this condition of participation that's a patient right to be informed um, and that they expect for this particular scenario um, that sensitive procedures basically sensitive exams, what we're talking about, that those should be exams where the patient consents to them. Um, and they'll, again, they're particularly watching for um, exams, procedures, things in which um, there should have been patient consent and whether there is documented consent. Okay, All, we got to tie everything into HIPAA. So, um, they specifically pointed to the Office of Civil Rights FAQ because, you know, under HIPAA, you could you could say I'm a patient, but I would like to restrict the use of my information. And so they noted that a person could request to restrict their information from medical trainees. So they could say, I don't want any of my information to go to students or other people that are are in training. Um, so that's something for us to th think about. I don't know how often that will come up. but um, the Office of Civil Rights did write a letter to the hospitals and said there should be clear guidelines to ensure providers and trainees obtain and document patient consent um, before performing sensitive examinations in all circumstances, but particularly if the patient is under anesthesia. So I think that tells us a little bit about the story. So um, that's, that's that. There's not a ton to say on that, except we would just recommend um, that you look at the informed consent form that you have, make sure, match it up to the revised tag, which is A0955, to make sure that the requirements they have in there um, still match your form, still match your policy and procedure. Um, and, um, and likely there will need to be updates because they do really want you to address these medical trainees. 
The other thing they mentioned is the policy, medical staff policy that you might have on what procedures and treatments require patient consent. Um, they will be looking to see if you have added um, this issue about um, sensitive examinations um, or things performed just for educational purposes. So look at, look at that as well. And as always, when you're looking at this, double check your state and federal law consent requirements in case those have been updated since you looked at it last. And then I listed the three tags there um, for the state operations manual. Appendix A is where it's got that interpretive guidance to tell surveyors what they want them to look for when they're surveying. And then now I think we're on to polling question number two. Today's second polling question is, under the new CMS guidance changing informed consent requirements, covered entities, healthcare providers should not update the consent form, update policy and procedures, develop a policy of exams, procedures that require consent, provide HIPAA training on non-disclosure of PHI requests, wait for additional guidance before doing anything. Remember, you must answer the polling questions to receive CPE credit. Thank you, and now back to our presenters. Oh, I love that. Good job, everyone. <laughs> yeah. Yes, good job, everyone. Um, uh, we've, you know, we've, we've, we started off strong. We dove in um, on reproductive health care. Um, we've talked about informed consents. One thing we wanted to talk for a little bit about was um, state laws as it relates to consumer information privacy. Um, in the last two years, many states have adopted state laws that are protecting the information provided by consumers to complete a business transaction. So names, I mean, think about it. It's, it's not PHI, but it's individually identifiable health information. It's our names, addresses, financial information, um, even sometimes our IP address and, and where we're, where we're um, our geographic location. So um, because of the, just the overwhelming amount of electronic transactions that um, have been conducted, um, there, there are obligations um, in, in, in your states um, to notify consumers about how that information is being used, um, how it's being retained, um, and, and also obligations to get consent from consumers before um, they use the, uh, or before organizations or websites or applications use the information that, that they've input into um, these applications and, and websites. So we wanted to talk just a little bit about that because the consumer information privacy laws just expand protection of this information. Um, and again, the goal is to protect it. It's not to make anybody's lives harder, but um, it is for that protection of the information because it's 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 not just HIPAA anymore. It's not just PHI that, that's getting, um, getting misused. So Karen, if you'd go to the next slide. Hold, please. There. So as you can see here, there are several state laws already in effect as it relates to consumer information privacy. There are several that are coming into play or already have come into play this year in calendar year 2024. There are a lot coming into play in 2025 and just a couple more left in 2026. So these are, um, you know, th mm -hmm. we're going to keep seeing this, and not only are we going to are we going to see them come into play, we're going to keep seeing enforcement actions around it, mm -hmm. um, as well as the need to be on top of what our states require when it relate when it comes to some of this information that that's being utilized from a consumer um, information standpoint. So although each state law is a little different they have a shared goal. Um, the goal is to protect this information. Uh, we don't want it to fall into the wrong hands. We wanna make sure that it's um, secured when, when it is obtained and, and, and utilized. Um, you know, they don't want, they really don't want, here's the, well, okay, let me start over. What, what they don't want to see is that a website or an organization obtains this information. Karen likes to use the example, you're buying shoes. You're online, you're buying shoes. You provide <laughs> what I do a lot. 
Yeah, she loves you. So, but but you're online. You're buying the info, or you're putting the information in, so you can complete the transaction for the shoes. But then all of a sudden, you start getting personalized ads popping up on your on your phone when you're on in you know in applications, or they're starting to pop up on Google when you open Google. You're starting to get get notifications. And what's happening is this information may be being sold for marketing purposes. And then now it's in the hands of additional people that when Karen bought her shoes, didn't anticipate it being in the hands of. And what this really does is it increases the likelihood or risk for identity theft. And that's really what, what these consumer privacy laws are trying to protect. So um, the state law requirements, you'll, you'll see the privacy policy, the online privacy policy, which all organizations have, it's usually at the bottom of the screen, you know, you click a link and it takes you to the policy, as well as consent. And when we talk about consent, are we filling out a form and saying um, we consent to the use of, of our information or, you know, we understand how you use our information? We're not really filling out a form, but Karen, if you can go to the next slide. We are clicking this. Uh, I'm sure everyone is familiar with um, with these uh, reject all, accept all. Our website use, utilizes cookies. Um, this is how we determine personalized ads, to, you know, to pop up for your viewing pleasure. Um, we we use it for marketing purposes to track our internet traffic, our website traffic. Do you accept? Um, this is the consent that these state laws want to see. It's what they require. Simply, state, these laws don't accept the fact that just because a user goes onto your website and starts scrolling through or they're swiping through on their phone, they don't accept that as consent. They want the user to actually have to click that they acknowledge that some of, that this information is being, um, is being um, kept, is being obtained, is being utilized. Um, and that's what this is. So I know we get it on every website and maybe most of you just click accept all, I wanna go buy my shoes. Um, or, you know, maybe some of you uh, click reject all, um, but really that's what this is. This is you as the consumer providing your affirmative consent that you understand that these technologies are being utilized and, and we call them tracking technologies um, to, to um, to review information, to get more data about you and about other users. Karen, would you have anything else to add to that? I was gonna say, and what's interesting, you know, they, they always put, cause they want you to consent to their policy. So if you click on any website, the cookie policy, or it'll say privacy policy, it's always posted almost at, always at the bottom of their, somebody's website. And it is supposed to list all the uses and disclosure. So if they're selling it to someone, you know, you would say accept all, you're in essence consenting to that. So you might you might want to look at a couple of privacy policies, but mostly mostly it um, you know it'll have have how they use your information and 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 if they use tracking technologies, they're describing that. Yeah. So um, I would just say you know if it, most of the policies are pretty much the same, um, but you know might want to go take a look and read and just see exactly what what data is being utilized so we talked about cookies and we i, ma I made the mention of tracking technologies um so what are these uh well they are uh cookies is the most common example but they it's a script or a code that is embedded into a website or a mobile application and it's used to gather information about about the application or website's users um it'll it'll look up you know uh, where you're from, where your IP address is, your geographic location, what do you click on um, as you're scrolling through the website or the app? Um, what do you search for when you're on there? It, it maintains this information and then it helps these organizations sort of re rethink their marketing maybe when they need to. We see our users are really looking at this, but not this. Um, so they can be really good, but they do allow the opportunity for misuse. And so, you know, just because there is this this wealth of information um, in in everybody's hands now due to these the use of these technologies, um, while while I mentioned that it can be good, it can be subject to mi misuse. It can be shared 
um, inappropriately and then um, increasing risk to that information. Because when we think about that information, we can't call it PHI all the time because it may not be medically related or healthcare related, but it's still the same information. Sometimes you're entering the last four of your social, you're entering a date of birth, um, you're entering, you know, age, all of that information. And so that's that's information that, that we want protected. We as consumers want protected. And so that's the purpose behind these laws. And again, as Karen mentioned, we have to tie it all back to HIPAA, right? So we talked about <laughs> consumer privacy and the, and the various state laws on those. Um, we talked about the tracking technologies, but HIPAA can be implicated. Um, through use of these tracking technologies. And in fact, the OCR issued a bulletin on December 1st of 2022, um, which it, it goes through um, and discusses entities that are regulated by HIPAA um, sharing information um, with, with things like with organizations such as social media companies or marketing companies. Um, and and the OCR takes the stance that even if the patient or the person is not a current patient, but maybe they're on your website trying to request an appointment, or they're looking up different provider specialties and seeing if you know any there's anybody there that could assist with their with their current issue. They're entering information. They're entering medical information. They may be entering information about their symptoms, um, information on you know their age, all of that current medication sometimes. Um, the OCR views that as a potential relationship with that with that healthcare organization, and therefore the information is protected health information that, that is being collected and subject to HIPAA. So um, even though it would be considered individually identifiable health information, from a technical standpoint, because it's the, the person is not a current patient, the OCR doesn't view it that way, and um, has advised that it should be treated as protected health information and protected in the same exact way. So one thing I would say with regard to takeaways on these tracking technologies is, do you know where they all are in your organization? Do you know what, what is being used? And if you do know, are you monitoring to make sure that that information is being protected and only used or disclosed as either required by HIPAA or state law? And it can be your consumer privacy laws. It can be your privacy laws. It can be um, so many things. So, um, you know, first, first step would be to identify those tracking technologies. What's being used by your organization? And do you have your arms around how that data is being kept uh, protected. Okay, so I just scared you a whole bunch about now there's all these applications and websites and we have to do this, you know, privacy protection and individually identifiable health information. Um, oh, now we might have them in, in our organization and we gotta protect that data because HIPAA is implicated. The one thing to keep in mind, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit in more detail, the HIPAA rules don't protect information entered into mobile applications or websites that aren't um, <clears throat> regulated or offered by a, a regulated entity. So, um, however, we want to point out other laws may apply. Um, there's other organizations. I just talked about the consumer privacy. This is how we're kind of um, rolling everything back to HIPAA. I just talked about the consumer privacy. Um, the FTC is another agency where um, those applications and websites may be subject to scrutiny and investigation for how they're utilizing that data. But Karen, if you'd go to the next screen, please. My Fitness Pal, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this app. Um, users go in, they enter age, you know, weight, what they ate that day, what they worked out, you know, all this information about themselves um, and, and related to uh, their, their health, right? They're using it so that they can get healthier and track their progress. Um, this app would not be regulated under HIPAA. It's one of the ones that would be regulated by one of those other agencies that, that uh, we've already talked about or that Karen's going to cover in just a minute because it's still individually identifiable health information and it still needs to be kept secure 
and the privacy of it needs to be maintained. But HIPAA doesn't come into play because there is no regulated entity, no entity that is subject to the HIPAA rules and regulations that manages this application. Whereas on the next slide, now this one is an example, think your portals or the, the apps that um, you know, healthcare organizations have us, have us utilize so we can go check our test results, request appointments, email our doctors. Um, those are subject to the HIPAA rules and regulations and any tracking technologies associated with those must be, um, must be identified and monitored and, and you must ensure that any use or disclosure of that information is protected as required by HIPAA. I think that that's helpful, Erin, because it's telling us basically, right, on it's it sort of either the owner of the business, right, is either a covered entity, business associate, somebody regulated by HIPAA, they are responsible for any information put in an app or a website or whatever you want to call it, some online way that you're inputting the information, it's going to be protected. It needs to be protected uh, as PHI and versus um, there are protections for if a company, right, owns information um it tells you fitness that what was the first one fitness my pal. fitness pal my fitness pal so my fitness. If you put information in that that's a business that's not a hipaa covered entity right and so but but they can get in trouble with state laws and then we're going to talk about this in a minute that they could get in trouble with sort of federal law as well does that make right. that right that's right. And I would also say, you know, it's important, important to point out if your organization is using an application, but it's developed by somebody else. I'm, I think Epic, like if there's, you know, the Epic portal yeah. or any of that, it's still your portal. It's still got your patient data. So it doesn't all fall back onto Epic, right? For example, to make sure that, that everything's being monitored and managed appropriately, you're still responsible for that. So I would keep that in mind. Um, again, I, I could go off on a whole other side note with info blocking and um, interoperability, but that's another presentation. But you know, those, those applications are required to be certified health IT you know, providers under those regulations. So there are um, some assurances there you know, if they are certified by, by the Office of the National Coordinator, but um, still you have to manage that data and monitor it and protect it. That, that's super helpful, I think. And then this this topic is we just wanted to make you aware of this because again, it can get confusing. This is called the Federal Trade Commission Health Breach Notification Rule. It sounds an awful lot like HIPAA. So our main message here is to tell you if someone brings this to you, if you're a compliance officer, you're an HIM or whatever, and said, hey, I think they've updated the HIPAA breach notification. You know, they haven't. This this is the Federal Trade Commission. So We'll tell you who they are. So kind of like that there are state agencies um, or state laws that protect consumers. This is the same thing. This is the, but on a national level, the Federal Trade Commission is a federal agency. And basically they have the authority to investigate and prosecute, um, uh, regulate certainly businesses. Think of it like that. And so um, if they have an FTC act and rules that protect consumers, so if businesses basically take consumer information, again, the shoe shopping um, for, you know, I'm buying the shoes, I've done the transaction, but then my information is taken, sold or disclosed. And again, risk of identity theft or whatever, um, that business could be fraudulently taking my information was used, you know, sort of, let's say, beyond what I anticipated. So they also were concerned about, um, you know, financial losses that people might suffer, identity theft, and so they regulate this as well um, and require that businesses protect a consumer's information. So the main thing to say is this, again, this sort of almost sounds like HIPAA, but we just don't want people to be confused. If you are a covered entity and you're covered by HIPAA, then you are not, your apps and things are not covered by this. So we're talking more about the MyFitnessPal as an example of that company that's not regulated by HIPAA, right? Um, this would apply to their health apps, similar technologies where you're entering um, what they call personal health record identifiable health information. They have definitions that sound the same, covered health provider, you know, healthcare services and supplies. 
And then they have recently, they always had a, uh, they've had a health breach notification rule, but they've amended it. And this is recent, so we wanted to make you aware of it. They define breach security. So we all do care about this as consumers. We're all consumers. We do put our information into businesses, websites, or apps, or whatever. Um, the And so a breach of security would include um, an unauthorized acquisition. So let's say a hacker, right, gets in there. But it also is an unauthorized disclosure. So that business has done the wrong thing, like beyond the, the laws or beyond the FTC Act. They have um, basically disclosed my information wrongfully. So that could be a violation of this Act. Um, and we're not going into any great detail. We're kind of updating you on, I mean, if you want this information or someone asks you about it, these are definitions that change. But I think Aaron really pointed out that the main thing here was they amended their definitions to say it's not just websites anymore. I think a lot of the rule was written about websites and now it's any online service. So it's even things we can't even think of yet that they haven't developed. But right now we talk about apps or portals or whatever, but there are probably lots more things in the, in the works that we will soon be entering information in. Um, so anyway, just to make you aware of that. And then the breach notice itself, um, they talk about how you would give notice to a consumer. So obviously if Aaron and I are using our app to buy our shoes, then um, they could message us back through the app. That could be a form of notice of breach um, that could be used or text messages or things like that. Sort of, you know, that, that makes sense to me. The way I'm communicating with them is the way I'm gonna get the information back from them, the business. Um, it does talk a lot about like what is clear and conspicuous notice and what's understandable. And they give a lot of examples of that. Um, you have to describe the types of health information involved. You have, if you know the third party that acquired the information, perhaps like you gave it to them, you have to disclose that in the notice. Um, so that I think that's a good uh, a good step in the law for sure. Um, and then finally, again, this looks very much like it, but doesn't it? <laughs> um, you have to notify the consumers within 60 days of discovery without unreasonable delay. And then there are two options. You also have to notify the FTC. But if it's 500 or more people, you have to notify them at the same time you're notifying the consumers. If you, um, if it's fewer than 500 people, you can wait till the end of the year plus another 60 days. So it's sort of a smaller breach. But if it's a larger breach, um, consumers and everybody. But again, this is where we think it could get, someone could come to you if you're the HIPAA privacy officer or the compliance officer and say like, hey, did you know this change? And so don't panic. It's did it change. Um, and then this this was interesting. Aaron gathered all this, um, all the recent settlements. And the, one of the ones that they're all interesting reads for sure. But one of the FTC settlements on this issue, um, they stated in the upper right hand corner that this is their frame. They're going to vigorously enforce the health breach notification rule to defend consumers health data from exploitation and companies collecting this information should be aware that the FTC will not tolerate health privacy abuses. So I guess for us as consumers, we should know that, that they are taking great pains to protect health information that is not that is in a situation in which it is not protected by HIPAA. Um, so sort of filling, the, filling that gap. Um, so that, that should be comforting to all of us. Um, there also is, um, it's obviously, it would be a violation of the Federal Trade Commission Act. We talked about that a little bit. And the penalties are steep. I mean, each one is over $50,000 and there can be criminal penalties as well. I um, think we are to polling question number three. Our last polling question is, the health breach notification rule applies to websites of PHR related entities, mobile applications of PHR related entities, internet connected devices of PHR related entities, user downloads info from non-PHR related mobile applications, all of the above. Thank you and now back to our presenters. Okay, that looks good. We have such a smart group with us today. <laughs> so exciting. 
<laughs> well, with that, yeah. we want to, we want to, you know, we are uh, not um, oblivious to the fact that there are so many things on the horizon, um, not just as it relates to privacy, but also with security and even regulatory compliance outside of those areas. Um, we're keeping our, our finger on the pulse of that, um, continue to, you know, we'll continue to provide thought leadership and information as, as things happen. Um, Karen and I were talking, we're very excited um, just to kind of see how all of this starts getting interpreted once things start getting into play um, and, and, be, and just seeing how it, how it moves through the process um, since we're just kind of on the cusp of all of it. But feel free to reach out with any questions. And of course, as mentioned at the beginning of the um, session that any questions we'll respond to by email. Thank you for listening to this PYA webinar recast. The video recording, slides, and associated material for this and all PYA webinars are available on our website. If you have any questions or if we can help, please contact us at pyapc.com. Thank you again for joining us and have a great rest of your day.